Hello and welcome. My name is Philip Manfuri and this is the business edition of PM Express. Thanks for joining us. Now in recent weeks we've seen the fund management industry in the broader capital markets come under some scrutiny because people have complained about their locked up investments here and there. Well, we'll be discussing this in this show. We want to find out what exactly is the way forward and how do we not return to such a mess or such a situation where people go on and on complaining about their inability to access funds uh, from fund management companies, investment companies, and so have you. But before we can have all that, we have to put some things to perspective. We want to find out the regulator of this industry, that's the Securities and Exchange Commission, what exactly is their role and how does it inform what's going on in the industry? We've put together some infographs for you to understand what exactly the SEC, that's the Securities and Exchange Commission, regulator to the capital, capital market, get up to. So let's look at this for now. Right, so that was uh, some information on the SEC. That's the Secrets and Exchange Commission's role. And as you can see, regulatory, surveillance, market development, and also they advise the government of the day on policies related to the capital markets or the securities industry. Also, you realize that the Ghana Stock Exchange, Ghana Fixed Income Markets, Ghana Alternative <coughs> Exchange, and Ghana Commodities Exchange all come under the purview of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Then we also have different market operators. We have uh, Registrars, we have unit trust, we have uh, um, fund managers, broker dealers, and the list goes on and on. So all these institutions, all these operators come under the Securities and Exchange Commission. But in recent times, the fund management industry does come under some scrutiny <coughs> because a couple of them uh, have failed to honor obligations to you and I, their investors or their customers. So we want to put all this into perspective on this show. I have two astute gentlemen to help me do this. Um, first one, he's the Deputy Director General of the Secrets and Exchange Commission, that's the regulator. His name, Paul Abibio. And my second guest, he's the President of the Ghana Securities Industry Association. His name, Emmanuel Alex Asidu. And he's also the Managing Director of Stanley Ghana Limited. They are also a fund management company right here in Ghana. So these two gentlemen are going to help us run through the issues in, let's say, 45 minutes or so and for us to become better informed. Because at the core of all this, and one of the <coughs> main objectives of the SEC is investor protection. Without protecting you and I, they have no business at all in this industry. So that's their key objective, is their overarching objective. Investor protection, and it's very key. So but we want to start off, before we get into the cracks of the fund management space, we want to start off from a regulatory angle. The SEC has been forthcoming in a number of notices and they've informed us, kept us up to speed when things are going on or are going wrong in the industry. But should something change when it comes to this? We'll find out. Let's take a quick break. Right, thanks for staying with us. This is the business edition of PM Express. My name is Philip Nanfuri. Before we go to the break, we're just putting things into perspective for you. We showed you what the SEC does, its, its main objectives. Now we want to zoom into our conversation. We want to start off with their mode of communication, their approach. Yes, they've kept us informed and abreast with what's going on, with the goings on in the capital market of the securities industry. But some have complained that it's not enough. They want to hear more, particularly on the revocation of the licenses of some five fund management companies. <coughs> the, the SEC did notify us, yes, but in there, there was no peculiar or particular reason as to why these five had their licenses revoked. 
So obviously, we're going to speak to Paul first. Obviously, he's the di Deputy Director General. He's from the regulator. And we're going to find out why exactly. Paul, thanks very much for joining us. So first, first one, yes, um, last week, we had uh, the notice from the SEC that five fund management companies had had their licenses revoked. Uh, obviously, weeding out bad nuts is important. But in the, we expected to see the reasons why. Is it a typical practice that in such communication, you are not told, we the public, are not told initially why these companies had licenses revoked? Or what was the reason behind the commission not adding the, the reason why the licenses were revoked? OK. Um, thank you, and good evening to your, to your viewers. Um, for, 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 for these five firms, um, they actually obtained their licenses some time ago. The, the law says that when you obtain a license, you have to commence operations within six months after obtaining the license. Um, they hadn't actually commenced operations yet. Um, so the, the revocation really was at an administrative process. And that's it's part of our effort to clean up the register of licensees and ensure that firms that are putting themselves out there as having our license um, are also working and reporting to us um, as part of the enforcement and the supervisory function that we perform. So that's, that's really that. Um, we didn't necessarily include information because in a sense, we felt there wasn't that much more to say um, okay. to these firms. Okay. It, it may have been helpful, but I think it was necessary to let the public know that these firms no longer hold our license, so that if they approach you or later on you hear that, oh, this person's in business doing this particular thing, the public is, is aware that the license is, not, is no longer valid. OK, um, given the low level of um, all things being equal, the low level of financial literacy, in our country, in, in a time where we've experienced an issue with the banking sector uh, through 2017 to 2018, it, from your perspective, when you're communicating, wouldn't you think it's prudent that you immediately push out all the information so that the uninformed takes a fixed mindset rather than maybe, okay, so five companies have been revoked, but we don't know why. Then it starts spreading some fear and panic. Will you agree with such assertions that such a, a mood, not given a reason, even though it's not, not, nothing much to go by, like you said, not given it within that notice, will rather heighten fear and panic. Um, the point is well noted. I think with these things too, we're, we're looking at our communication strategy um, and trying to, to tidy it up, um, trying to take fair my enforcement actions. So it falls within our purview that when we get feedback, We'll take it on board. Um, we'll explore how we, we put such information out. Um, and so that's it's a valid consideration. Yeah. And then I must commend you for your, I think, Facebook handle and uh, Twitter, Twitter handle. Yeah. I see a lot of regulators not actively using financial services regulators, not actively using social media handles. And I think if you go on your Twitter timeline and you see the SEC yeah. there, I think it's quite encouraging so that you can get to all parts of the market. So I think. For that, is some, uh, the commission deserves some commendation. Emmanuel, um, from the industry association perspective, I know somewhere in 2014, you guys were given some sort of powers to self-regulate. Am I, am I right or, or wrong? wrong. I'm, I'm wrong. So w what does then your body have to play in such situations where there are a lot of happenings? How does the industry association fit into the two? <coughs> Uh, assuage the concerns of depositors or customers? It's, it's a challenging ask because um, for now we're just an association. We're supposed, to, we're supposed to collect information on our members, make sure that they conduct themselves the way that a fund management firm should conduct itself. But what makes it a difficult ask is that we don't yet have the, the, the ability to crack the whip. If we have actually applied for self-regulatory status, it's we're going back and forth with the SEC, and they're helping us with our application. And we think we should be done within the next six to twelve months. And once we have that, we should be able to help the SEC to clean up what has to be cleaned up. But for now, really, what we do is more of moral suasion and public education than anything else. Okay. Um, and another key issue that comes up, and 
Emmanuel, I'll take your thoughts on this before I go to Paul. The SEC introduced the color coding system to inform us on fund management companies that have no major regulatory issues and those that have major regulatory issues or those have, that those have issues, example, regulatory issues, pending complaints, etc. And I remember when uh, Reverend Obama was speaking on Super Money Issue, he said, and I think there's a notice on your website that says, it does not necessarily mean that these companies are either safe to invest with or not safe to invest with. One would argue that the, it sort of creates some fear in the minds of those that will hear that there's a list of companies that have a gold bar around them and those that have a red bar or color around them. Do you subscribe to such assertions? It's, it's iffy. First of all, our issue with the SEC SEC's color coding is that maybe the red should have been segregated a bit because we're not even sure whether if it's just a complaint that has not been resolved, you, you've been tagged red. Um, subsequent to the coding thing coming out, we've been told by the SEC that most of them have issues that are bigger than just ordinary complaints and that these are firms that have been given time to resolve these issues and those issues have not been resolved. Paul, you may correct me if I'm wrong. So, so they have a point there. But I guess because we are, in a, we are in an era where there's a lot of fear, it could probably have been, there could have been a bit more explanation on the side. Again, it's, I think it's a bit, the SEC is in a difficult situation. If I were the SEC, I would find it very difficult to come out and say firm A is doing really well or firm B is not doing really well. I mean, if firm A is supposed to be doing well as the SEC says and you invest there and something goes wrong, is the SEC liable? So they're supposed to put out some information. Uh, to sum it up, they should probably have segregated the red and, and, and broken it up a bit more. But they're, they're, they're doing their best under pretty difficult circumstances. Okay. Paul, um, in speaking to the Director General himself um, on the Super Money Show, I think what I gleaned that from his comments was, this is a fantastic thing to keep us all abreast with exactly what's happening with fund management companies. Because I'll, I'll, I'll try and put this in the same category as maybe a, a bank regulator telling us that these banks haven't filed their returns. But it doesn't necessarily mean that those banks are weak. Or, for example, this bank has been fined this amount of money. It doesn't necessarily mean that that bank is weak. It's just that it has a number of issues that must settle with its regulator. Do you think you are opening yourself up, as that's the SEC, to issues from both the market operators within this list that are in the red, and at the same time, investors or the public who don't really understand that red does not necessarily mean a negative? Do you think you're opening yourself up to a lot of issues? Um, well, the, the nature of information is that it's, it's subject to interpretation. Um, but the way financial markets work is that they rely on information, right? People make decisions based on information. They commit capital based on the information available to them. So as a regulator, part of our, our mandate is to also take, take action that ensures a fair and transparent marketplace. And one of the things we say is that an informed investor is a protected investor. Mm -hmm. We cannot stop people from taking certain risks. And we cannot um, disclose some of the investigations we do okay. to the public. Mm -hmm. But when we have material information that we think that pu the public should know about to inform their decisions, um, if there is no neutral source of truth, if there is no um, balanced way to communicate that, that leaves, I'd say, a gap. And if you are there to serve as a bridge, Mm -hmm. between the, 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 the regulated entity and the public, and you don't perform that function well, then people act in chaos. And that also creates uncertainty. And I think in the initial phases of this communication we are trying to do, obviously there'll be some um, challenges and there'll be some kinks we'll have to iron out. Uh, so we, we appreciate that. And I think this, this issue of identifying firms, trust me, we've debated it for quite a while. Um, and there have been all kinds of views. Yeah. But I we rely imagine. on our law, and the basis is that we should take certain actions to, to, to stabilize the marketplace and to inform the view. Just to clarify, since we're on this program, as, as Reverend mentioned, these are temporary designations. Yeah. And that's why we were clear to say that these are firms with specific 
regulatory breaches or they have pending complaints. The complaint cycle, ideally the investor has engaged the firm, some time has elapsed, they haven't been resolved, then they've come to SEC. So at the point where they've come to SEC, we also hear them out. If after the hearing, it's not like the first complaint they come, we go out there and we change your color code. Yeah. We hear you out, we understand what's going on, and we say that resolve the thing within this time frame. If it's not resolved, we start to indicate that this is the situation with this firm. Um, and it's, 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 it's a buyer beware market. The firms in gold are, uh, we are not vouching for any firm. When we license a firm, it's about the future, how they'll perform. Okay. But we can only look at the past. And when you look at the past and you have past records and you have past actions, you can comment on that with some level of authority. The future, um, it, it's hard to say what's going to happen. I can't tell you what T-bill rates will be six months from now. Sure. What more, how a fund will perform six months from now. And any fund manager will have a hard time telling you my fund will do X in this period. They'll say we'll try. Um, and as a regulator, too, we have to acknowledge that we cannot guarantee you that our regulators are 100% fail proof. But we can say that here's what we have. And it's what we think is fair to know. One of the elements is that we are seeking to enhance the disclosure levels to the public. Okay. So that's, that's where this is coming from. Okay. Um, and that's, that's the direction that we look to, to, to drive the markets in. Okay. So for, for our viewers and listeners, we put together uh, an infograph that shows us um, as of today at the time we prepared this infograph. And I must state that it's not a static list. If you want to access the full list, you go to the SEC's website. That's sec.gov.gh. You click on licensees, then you click on fund managers, and it gives you everyone in the fund management industry. You have a whole list of market operators, but for the purposes of our conversation, it's the fund managers. So you go to the SEC's website, sec.gov.gh, you click on licensees right at the bottom, then you click on fund managers, and it will give you the list. But I want you to look, as of today, how many we have in the industry, how many are in the gold, how many are in the red rows. So let's take a look at this. Right, so you've seen the um, categorization. You have the gold rows. That's if you go to the website, it's actually in a row. So gold and red. So 79 of them, gold rows, fund management companies, and 49. That's as of today. This is not a static list, I must say. The SEC says, as and when a market operator, that's a fund manager, improves his status from the complaint side whatsoever, they will update that information. So if you want a current list as of tomorrow morning, Saturday, Sunday, you have to go to the SEC's website to access it. But it gives you a picture of the general uh, numbers of fund management companies in the country, 128 after the time we put this infograph together, 79 of them in the gold rules, 49 of them in the red rules. And it does not mean that these companies are either safe to invest with or not safe to invest with. And that's the key part you must take away from this. This is more or less like Paul said, disclosure keeping you informed and abreast with what's going on in the fund management industry. But now, uh, gentlemen, I would, I, would, I would like to move on to the problems in the industry. And I would take it from Reverend Seven Point, I, I think I call it Seven Point Agenda. He just said seven points where he thinks these are the causes of the industry. And we would have that infograph displayed for you to see. But at the top of that list was what he referred to as counterparty default. And 
to that inform, it sounds like a whole lot of rocket science, financial lexicon <laughs> and jargon. Paul, I want you to break down for us when, when we say there's a counterparty default. What exactly are we referring to? So, uh, basically, it implies that money has been lent to one party. So, a fund manager has given money to another firm in the form of a debt security or a loan. Um, and when the loan has come due, the, the other party has failed to pay them back. So basically, it's a default, the equivalent of what you might call a non-performing loan okay. in the banking sector. OK. Yeah. That's, that's uh, I think so. Let me, let me try and break it down. So if I'm a fund management company, I gather investors' funds. I put it into, for example, a bank's fixed deposit. The bank then unlends it out to another person. If the person fails to pay back the bank, the bank also cannot honor its obligations to the fund management company. Is that a is that an apt description? It's fairly. I mean, the More bank the bank doesn't pass through its defaults to you directly. Okay. You face the bank as one entity. So you, the depositor, you don't see who they've given their money Money's to. to. Okay. So it doesn't pass through like that. But in a sense, one might say that the bank may have liquidity issues. Okay. And they fail to honor its obligations to you. Alex, do you have anything to share? He's, he, he's, he's correct. If the, one of the key causes of the problem is, is, is these counterparty defaults. Investment management or fund management firms have given their money to banks and savings and loans firms and these have been unable to a large extent to give back those monies to the investment firms. And he categorized it as liquidity issues. Obviously if if, your account, if a counterparty has a liquidity problem, then it's not able to give you back your, your client's money. And then, um, but linked to what he's saying, I think it's what caused this. The industry has its own issues, mm -hmm. but this particular problem was, was exposed when the banking sector cleanup okay. came out in force. Because it meant that, in effect, there was a squeeze within the banking sector. And since investment firms are fully exposed to that banking sector, it meant, that they couldn't, it meant that they couldn't get their monies. Either. Okay. So, so, okay, so I think with the explanation of it, uh, it's quite clear. But a, a question that just popped up in my mind is, what are the um, sorts of limits we have on investments? So I know, for example, the NPRE has its investment guidelines. Mm -hmm. So you can't go beyond 60% of your assets in the management in government securities, if I'm right, yeah. and then certain variations. With the fund management industry, what pertains there? Alex, uh, I want to yeah. start with you. Sure. What, what's the framework of the guideline there? Because sure. for you to be exposed to such an uh, in, in that manner, then it was really a lot from, from, from my perspective. What pertains with the... Bef before I even go into it, you need to look at it in context. Okay. The, the investment universe in Ghana is pretty limited. Mm -hmm. So you have all sorts of different asset classes that is different, different, different parts of the economy that you can invest in. You have, sh you have shares, you have fixed income, you have private equity, etc. But most fund management firms are bulked up in fixed income, which is deposits with banks mostly and treasury okay. bills, etc. For you not to get into trouble as a fund management firm, you have to abide by what I call the golden rule of fund management, diversification. Don't, not putting all your eggs in one basket. So you realize that with the pension sector, you don't have pension funds in as much trouble as mm -hmm. the, the other sector, the, invest, the plain investment management side, simply because the pensions regulator was a bit more prescriptive with its investment guidelines than the SEC was. I guess because they thought that these were pensioners' monies and they had to be careful mm -hmm. and it's a fast-growing segment of the financial space. They were very pres prescriptive. And so they have well-spelled out investment guidelines. Now the SEC has been slightly more, more open with, with, with those guidelines. And so, it f so the firms that are not in trouble are those firms that kept by that golden rule. Don't okay. put all your eggs in one basket. Typical internal guideline, don't expose more than 8% of your assets to one particular entity. If you did that and say one of these banks failed, typically it would only be about 5 to 8% of your, of your pot of funds that would go down. But we hear tales of firms putting in as much as 
70 to 80 percent of client funds in one uh, wow. in one counterparty with that one once it goes down everything goes the down. whole building goes down um paul uh, I, I i think there has been some introduction of investment guidelines or a review uh, yes. i don't know whether it's, an, it's a total overhaul or is this uh, some changes to it. Can you share some light on how it will improve things in the industry when it comes to um, asset allocation, if I can yeah. put it like that? Um, okay. I think that's, it's, a, it's a very valid point. And part of that framework um, is, to, is to ensure there is some level of fiduciary responsibility being exercised. Alex mentioned the concentration risks that we've mm -hmm. seen. Um, and that is, that's really unacceptable, to be honest with you. Um, but again, we didn't have clear frameworks that said you have to diversify. Okay. But if you come to what we call collective investment schemes, because those are, um, I would say, regulated frameworks. Collective investment schemes are? If you um, so can for example, for um, a mutual fund okay. or a unit trust. Um, and a collective investment scheme, in a sense, pools monies together okay. into a pot. <coughs> Okay. The pot has a defined mandate, and they communicate that we'll invest up to X amount in, let's say, government bonds, this much in equities, this much in debt, this much in X and Y securities. Um, so with, with that, it's clearer. Okay. But with the fund managers, what we would call separately managed accounts, okay. um, that is where you go to the fund manager and say, I want you to manage my money for me as best as you can, <coughs> and give me a certain kind of expected return. Okay. Um, there, there were no frameworks around it. Okay, so, so it's at the discretion of the fund manager? At the discretion, so we call them discretionary accounts. You can also okay. go to a fund manager and say, I want you to buy this particular bond for me. Okay. That is non-discretionary. Okay. So the fund manager doesn't have much of a say. If you go to me and say, I want to buy treasury bills, they have to buy the treasury bills for you. Okay. Okay. Now, the guidelines we've introduced um, places certain restrictions, for instance, related party transactions. Okay. Right? Those have to be documented. They have to go through the investment committee of the, the fund manager. We've also put certain restrictions on what they can do with a particular bank. For instance, their deposits can't make up um, the numbers along the top. I have about between 10 to 20 percent of a particular bank's deposit assets. Okay. Right? So you, the fund manager, if you make up 20% of the, of, the, of the bank's assets or the savings and loans assets and you are pooling your money, you're suddenly you're going yeah. to cause a collapse of the bank. Okay. And that is also not diversification because then if you think of um, liquidity issues, you think of underwriting their loans, literally you are <coughs> an owner of the bank in that sense. So, so those frameworks um, are put in to safeguard some of these principles that Alex has mentioned. And on one hand, you can't uh, stop people from taking certain kinds of risks, okay. but you can prescribe, I'd say, best practices. <coughs> and this, this framework we are putting in place <coughs> at least puts limits on certain activities that um, from on the face of it, one might say, could be inimical to, to the interest of investors. Okay, I think all this, you are, you are, it just lends credence to the, um, <coughs> the directive on the uh, guaranteed returns that um, seem to cause the problem of some fund management companies that we've seen, not to mention uh, names or getting to this, but I, I, I would assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen, that some of them overexpose themselves to certain um, spaces, and when this uh, guaranteed returns um, directive came, then they had a problem in pulling out because maybe, for example, we had the banking sector issues. So if one is exposed to a <coughs> bank in a certain manner and the bank already is exposed to other people in a manner, then it becomes difficult for them to recoup their funds. Am I right in, in, in this analysis that because of the issues that went on with the banking sector, if a fund manager has been a bit too free in a portion of funds, when, when it's time to collect, then it becomes a problem. Is that a right assertion? It's yeah, it's I fine. think that's a fair, it's a fair, it's a fair assumption to make. Okay, so uh, the, the sorry, the please. other, the other dimension also becomes a potential mismatch. Okay, right, because you you would have different investors coming into your your investment house at different points in time. So somebody comes and says, "I have, I want to give me money for ninety-one <coughs> days." That's X. 
and that person comes the following day or the following week and says, I want this much at this time. Another person, another period. They are all in this portfolio. And you've given this portfolio to, say, three different entities. Now, if at maturity, the person comes, but when you invested, you invested it the following three days later. So three days later, the person comes for his <coughs> funds, and you are not, you try to withdraw, you're not able to get funds that day, because then you are breaking your investment. Now, suddenly, the investor starts to feel jittery. Mm -hmm. So from a, what we call asset liability management perspective, it's easy to have mismatches okay. when you have such a framework. So beyond the counterparty risk, also comes the balance sheet management risk and evaluation as well. Because if you are breaking it, then who's going to lose? The one who came last week or the one who came the week after? True. And how do you value that loss? So sometimes they might have to, they would make a balance and then postpone <coughs> the issue. Okay. Right. And that, that also can create some problems because then suddenly your liquidity issues start to, to push against, against the business. Okay. I, I, I would want us to have a look at the infograph of the seven points that Reverend Obama shared with us on the Super Morning Show on Joy FM a couple of weeks ago. We put it together, the seven of them. Uh, let's take a look at it and we'll continue the conversation with the other key ones that are of particular concern to you and I. Yeah, thanks for staying with us. So that's um, more or less a wrap of Reverend Obama's seven points of causes and solutions to the problems in the capital market. And you saw at the beginning there was counterparty default. If I explain that, we looked at the fixed term or guaranteed returns. Fund managers, are, fund managers, I beg your pardon, are not supposed to give you guaranteed returns. If you want guaranteed returns, you can walk into a bank for that fixed deposit product whatsoever. But a fund manager is not supposed to do that for you. Then we had the related party transactions. You can see it sounds familiar, familiar as we saw this in the banking sector crisis also. We also saw corporate governance failure. That's number four. And the SEC has introduced a corporate governance code. And I believe, uh, Paul, they've, in they've introduced uh, conduct of business regulations for the market operators. That will be for Emmanuel's firms and then the other uh, people in the industry. Then there's also many license operators, and I believe you want to introduce new minimum capital requirements to deal with that issue, uh, fit and proper test, interviews, and then I think you want to uh, digitize the commission also. I think that was how Reverend Obama put it. Number six, the lack of information or disclosure requirements. I think you have mentioned that, that you guys are ramping up on your disclosure requirements. Then number seven, I find very interesting. It's a part of the conversation we mostly leave out when it comes to fund management issues. Number seven looks at rate chasing and lack of appreciation of risks, lack of financial planning. And I believe Paul has said it here, Reverend Obama said it on the Super Morning Show a couple of weeks ago. Investment is a risk. Any form of financial investment carries a degree of risk. There is no way you can enter any financial agreement with no risk. So we must all learn to appreciate the risks in their words. And I think they're going to be doing a bit more on the financial literacy campaign. And 
I think it will be all well and good. So, um, Imona wanted to say something uh, on Paul's point when we're talking about the counterparty default. You had a point you wanted to make. I, I just wanted to add that it's also linked to the guaranteeing of returns, amongst other things. If, if I've put in money from an investor, mm -hmm. first of all, an investment firm's balance sheet is, is very thin. I mean, even as we speak, it's about 100,000. That's, how, that's, that's your minimum capital required. Oh, okay. 100,000 CDs compared to a bank, which is now about 400, 400 million. million. So let's take it in perspective. Somebody comes in with 150,000 CDs and he wants to invest. And the investment firm hasn't got its, have, hasn't, doesn't have its ethical backbone really solid. If, it's decided, if it decides to guarantee their returns and it puts it in a bank, the entire pot in a bank, and that bank collapses, it's guaranteed when it's cap at 150,000, when its capital is just 100,000. Where's, where's it calling the funds from to back the investor up? And linked to that is the issue of education. What the general public must realize is that getting into an investment firm is getting into a different kettle of fish. It's the risk return dynamic for getting into investments is totally different from that same risk return dynamic for getting into a bank. Okay. With investment firms, higher risk, Higher returns. returns. With banks, lower risk, lower returns. It's like you want to drive either a Ferrari or you want to drive <laughs> a big old car, which is more stable. Yeah. Which one do you want? With a Ferrari, you probably get where you want to get to faster, but the risk of getting an accident is higher. Is higher. I think where we have erred on the market, ourselves as an industry, and maybe we need a little help from the SEC, is that we need to educate clients more that this is what they're getting into if they come in here. They need to understand that. Once they understand that, Investment firms won't be forced into what, what they were previously forced into. That was guaranteeing returns when, they had, when we had no business doing no that. Returns. Because in effect, we behaved like banks. Let, let okay. me, an interesting, oh. and I think that's, it's, it's good that these reforms are all happening concurrently. Because in a sense, some of the fund management firms were given monies to microfinance firms, finance houses, which also have a capital of, say, 1 million. So if you give 20 <coughs> million CDs to a firm with a balance sheet of 40 million CDs, when they're supposed to be mobilizing, I would say, financial inclusion amounts, yeah. the biggest they can take is 50,000 CDs. So technically, that's, that's not the business that these microfinance firms should be in. Right. True. So with, with this framework, we have to almost reposition. The businesses are different. Um, Microfinance, savings and loans are supposed to go out there, um, give micro loans, and take micro deposits. <coughs> Banks can do larger ticket transactions, they can take bigger risks. And that is the model. A fund management firm, and that's the other element of it, the professional approach to managing funds, the ethical requirements, are in a sense a bit higher because they have to use their, their best efforts. Mm -hmm. And they have to also have a sense of a track record. What has the professionals in the industry, what is their track record? What have they done in the past? How have they managed portfolios? How has their fund performed last year? If the person is making a promise this year, don't look at the following year, look at the previous the year. Past, yes. How did it do? So <coughs> that, that differentiation, and I think these kinds of engagements are really part of the education. And I think your, your, your messages go quite far. We get all kinds of inquiries, both locally and internationally as well. So. We're starting off, it's a journey, and the journey also starts. Part of it is also developmental, because the industry is also developing. And in developing the issues of definitions, the issues of responsibilities, the issues of, um, of, of personnel, and the issues of marketing, how you market a product, how you sell it to people, becomes very critical. And these are the things we'll be looking at along the lines of the conduct of business issues, the corporate governance areas. We need to focus a bit more on that as well going forward. Okay. One thing sticks out for me. Our messages are going far, and it's, <laughs> and, and, and it's put a smile on my face. This is the business <laughs> edition of PM Express. My name is Philip Nanfru, and my guest, Paul Abubio, he's the Deputy Director General of the Securities and Exchange Commission and Emmanuel Asedu. He's the President of the Ghana Securities Industry Association and the MD of Stanley Ghana Limited. We're taking a quick break. Thanks for staying with us. This is the business edition of PM Express. My name is Philip Nanfuri. As we draw down on this um, discussion on Ghana's capital, 
at the forefront of all this is the investor, you and I, making sure we are protected anytime we deposit, we invest our funds. But what's the future of the fund management industry? All the reforms the SEC is putting in place. We saw it with the banking sector. We had a governor on record saying that the reforms will kick in and we should see a stronger and more robust banking sector. But what about the capital markets? All the reforms that the Security and Exchange Commission is putting in, is it actually going to improve things in the fund management industry? Will we come back again to discuss people's locked up funds and people complaining and crying and wailing? No, we don't want that. So what's the future of the fund management industry? I'll start with Paul. Obviously, he's the regulator. And you give us some insights as to whether exactly all this, the directive on guaranteed returns, corporate governance codes, increase in minimum capital requirements, and everything. Is it going to really ensure that the capital market, squeezes industry, is in the right trajectory? Uh, yes, I, I definitely think so. And these, these reforms, I'd say, are part of our, our carrots and sticks approach. Um, because while we're doing some of these changes, we're also in the process of drafting a capital markets master plan, okay. um, which will lay out the broad strokes of, of our expected development over the next 10 years and how various players can fit into it. Okay. Uh, and part of it really is creating avenues for, for proper fund management, for proper governance, and for such firms that have good structures in place to succeed. Uh, putting in place the right tax frameworks to ensure that industries like private equity can pick up, okay. um, to ensure that pension funds that are growing now are also managed prudently. Um, and, and as they go international, the question becomes that why can't we have a fund manager based in Ghana operating across West Africa, right? Um, so so there, there's potential, there's potential for the industry mm -hmm. and, and we think that there's a need to, to have one, a strong regulatory environment but also an enabling macroeconomic environment okay. as well. Right. So that there's no crowding out again. So that, that intermediation role that funders are supposed to play, uh, we expect them to step up. Now that we are uh, putting restrictions on, um, I would say, unlisted securities they can trade in, the kinds of reporting we'll require, uh, we expect that they'll play a bigger role in intermediation, encouraging firms to come and list, trying to deepen the range of investment options. Okay. Um, in the marketplace, and that overall should 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 should, should benefit the markets. Yeah. Okay, Emmanuel, the 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 future of the fund management industry. Are you comfortable as uh, as an as an as association when you speak to your members, when you guys engage? Are you happy with what the SEC is doing to strengthen the industry? We are. I'm fully confident about the future of the industry for a number of factors. One, I mean, we have fast growing economy. Whether we like it or not, for all our complaints, people are getting wealthier, although maybe not at the pace that we expect. So people are going to increasingly have pots of funds that they want to put away. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Second thing is that this new regulator has shown some capabilities. They're ready to enforce. They're ready to help us clean up. What I think will help us get where we want to get to is what I call the three E's and the C. One, education. Mm -hmm. We need to educate ourselves as an industry with then industry players. We need to educate the market, potential investors and current investors that this is what you're getting into. We need to help them, empower them to ask questions. Education helps. And then we need more collaboration between financial sector regulators, the insurance regulator, the central bank, the, the SEC. I mean, if, if a bank has failed and that bank has an investment arm, does the bank King regulator know that probably the size of investment wing is bigger than the asset base is bigger than than the bank than its bank. We need more collaboration so that nothing slips under the radar. Then we need a keener ethical bent, especially amongst ourselves as industry players. We need to start putting others before ourselves. I mean, people people talk about growing the industry, growing the companies, but. Your company cannot grow if you're not putting your client's interest first. And we need to hammer that home. So the ethical bed must be keen. And then the last thing is enforcement. Uh, Ghana has all the nicest rules and regulations and laws, but we don't, you don't, you, we don't get that yeah. sense that. But hopefully, 
Uh, I'm not saying there should be regulatory overreach, but I'm saying that we need to get to a, and there are not just the investment sector, everywhere in the economy, everywhere within our social space, where when people do wrong, they are put to, the right thing is done, and others see that if you do the wrong thing, you will be caught out. If we can do those things, we should be smiling some years from now. I have hope. Okay. Something that struck me when you, when you mentioned greater collaboration, and it's something I, I, I don't know if maybe Paul may be privy to something of this. Should we get to a point in our capital market regulation? Because clearly some of the issues are from the regulatory angle, apart from the investor itself and the companies. Should we get to a point where we start practicing a different regulation? A different regulatory environment. Um, people are advocate for the Twin Peaks. Is that something that we should look at so that potential regulation handled one body, market conduct handled one body? Then we do have a situation where, because as we discussed, we saw the counterparty was one clear example of something was going on in A and it's affecting B and it affects C. Should we get to a point where? this type of regulation becomes part of Ghana, or our market development, financial services development, isn't there yet. I'll take 30 seconds from Paul, and then 30 seconds I from I think Paul should answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been thrown to you. Yes, it's, 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 it's a difficult situation. And there are countries now, let's say if you take Hong Kong, mm -hmm. um, they, they have the system we have. And Hong Kong is a very large, deep market that is, is respected and appears well regulated Indeed. as well. <coughs> and they run our system and they are doing well. And there are countries that used to have our system and have transitioned. And some countries have kept it, um, at the Twin Peaks, as you say. Um, I, I think it, it's a question of um, what makes sense for Ghana. Okay. And what is the, the, the strategy, really? It, it's more strategic and where, how we want to position the markets. Um, part of our development really has been organic. It's been from sort of how the financial sector emerged. Okay. And most of it started with the banking sector, so that took the lead. Mm -hmm. Then the other elements came out of that. Now we have to start thinking strategically, where do we want to go as a country? What role do we want financial markets to play in the development of the economy? Um, and we've done quite a bit of work in the past along these lines. Um, but again, we've reached a certain era. Normally, Markets move in cycles, you okay. know, there are booms and there are busts. Bust, yeah. When there are busts, you go back to the drawing board and then we have to think through what elements do we need to ensure that the next boom and bust cycle doesn't bring us down, Done. but sure. pulls us to a higher level. I, I, I think it's, it's neither here nor there. It's okay. very painful to, to integrate regulators. Mm -hmm. um, as you can imagine, these are institutions that have their own histories. They True. have their own little empires. So. It, it's a process, we've discussed it, but just to give you a heads up, the uh, a regulators, um, a first financial, financial Stability Council, financial stability council, council actually yes. has been established. And the aim of that really is to encourage collaboration. Mm -hmm. So we all agree that collaboration is key and, and the need to share information, the need to synchronize practices as well. Um, and it need to share if people have done bad things in one sector and these sectors are based on ethics they are based on um, fiduciary responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Should that person just switch over and do something else in a similar sector? Right, so that okay. notion of tagging the person. So some okay. of that collaboration is actually ongoing now. Okay. Um, I'll hold off on a firm view as to, but there, there needs to be greater collaboration. Really? I agree with That's Alex fine. on that point. Okay, yeah. Alex, your final words before we wrap up. I, I think what we need to do is do the basics right. We don't need to, and then we need more collaboration. But like I said, if we learn to put others first, whether you are, you are a regulator or you are an industry practitioner, and if we educate, I think we'll be fine. we should be fine. Paul, final words to, as a regulator, to all viewers and listeners. Are they safe? That's what they all want to know. Are they protected? Well, I, I think our, our disclosure regime now gives quite a bit of information. Okay. We'll continue to work at it. Um, you'll be hearing more from us okay. in the coming weeks and months. Um, for, the, for the public, I think people should also try to educate themselves okay. about investments. We will do our bit, but again, one of my bosses, you say the internet is not closed. Now everybody's on their mobile phone. We encourage people to do the research. Go online, find out about what the investments are. There are 
stocks on the stock market, sometimes it goes down, sometimes it goes up. But one of the wealthiest investors in time, Baron Rothschild, said that you should buy when there's blood in the streets. <laughs> so people complain that stock markets don't do well, but they've done well in the past. Yeah. And cumulatively over a 20 year time frame, my friend, it's been, it's been quite fabulous in the stock market. You don't get the, 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 the kick. And that's Reverend's point about people being aware that investments contain some risk. risk. There's also volatility. I want the public to appreciate that. Um, yeah, and capital true. markets is a place to have unlimited upside. Right? People have made millions in the capital markets. It takes time. It's not an overnight game long of riches. That's so what we want, want that long-term view to be, to be carried. Okay. So okay. those are a few points that I'd want the public to, to, okay. to keep in mind. Okay. So you've heard it all. The regulator had his final say and all is well and good. Inform yourself. They will do their bit. And peel your eyes. And on shows like this, we'll do our very best to also educate and inform you. This has been the business edition of PM Express. My name is Philip Nanfuri, and my guest, Paul Abibio, is the Deputy Director General of the Securities and Exchange Commission, that's the SEC, and Emmanuel Asedu. He is the President of the Ghana Securities Industry Association and the Managing Director of Stanley Ghana Limited, a fund manager. Goodbye. <laughs>